really far along in their career. And it was really hard, like as a student to place myself in the shoes of somebody that was like 30 years ahead of me. Um, and like bridging that gap and trying to see like, well, what's it going to look like, like next year in five years. And so, yeah, I don't know. I'm in the early stages of my art career right now. And so maybe that'll be helpful, <laughs> you know, um, cause nobody like tells you how, how to do it, but anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I'm actually might've started out on the last slide here. Oh, silly me. Here. That's okay. We can get a sneak a sneak preview. A sneak of peek at my most recent thing. So I structured this kind of chronologically, um, so I could like take you through the process and kind of what I've been thinking about. And so, drawing is the primary focus of my art practice. Um, I've always been quite like methodical and pretty obsessive um, about my rendering, and I think like we can like see that as I go through my images. Um, but I think during college, especially, I was kind of drawing um, through the lens of like mental illness issues I was having um, and using drawing as a tool to like work through some of those things. Um, and so that's kind of, this is a portrait I did of, of a friend um, and I had had friends modeling for me and the portraits started getting like a little dark, like this one's fine. She's just in some water. I more was just interested in drawing water, but I was realizing that I think I was feeling it was feeling weird to draw other people, especially in like maybe dark or weird positions. And I felt like I was making it about myself and my own problems. So it just made more sense to kind of pivot and start using myself as a model. Um, and so now my work is entirely self portraiture. Um, I haven't uh, drawn another person until recently, and that was my partner. But other than that, it's been it's been all self-portraiture. It's like a, a pretty flexible tradition of self-portraiture is what I would say. Um, but I primarily use graphite and I create these realistic autobiographical drawings on paper. Um, and so I still do that. <laughs> and this is kind of where it started. This was one of the first drawings I had made that was of myself. And at the time I was getting really interested in hair as like, as a motif, it felt like feminine and beautiful, but also, you know, people are, when you're in a bad situation, they'll be like, oh, it's a hairy situation. And there's something about it, <laughs> the, the feeling of like hair stuck between your fingers and toes when you get out of the shower. Like there's something kind of evil about it too. It's like this feminine, beautiful, yet evil. I don't know. I started thinking of it as like an evil force. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, you know, thinking of it as being this like really claustrophobic kind of thing I, I don't know it felt icky to me and kind of perfectly was like suiting what I was thinking about at the time and so I also this is a, an intaglio print which was really fun to make but yeah I was thinking of hair as being like this enemy of like your own enemy within yourself and you're growing it and it's it's you and it's a it's the dark side of yourself and so it was also at this time that I was getting really into internal family systems therapy. It's like a, a therapeutic modality to treat all sorts of mental health disorders. And it basically requires that you split yourself into multiple different characters. And you kind of give these characters different personalities and you can even name them. Um, for me, I just chose different versions of myself and you know they, they all had different functions and it kind of is like reparenting all of these different parts of yourself and kind of separating yourself from your feelings and and I and personifying them as different parts and so that's kind of what the therapy therapy that I was going through during college was all about and so it was so weird because I just started thinking about myself as multiple people like I wasn't thinking about myself as one person I was thinking about myself as a bunch of different people and so a lot of my drawings like since then have been me with myself <laughs> And so that's kind of what I started doing. Um, I titled this one Managers, Exiles, and Firefighters because these are kind of therapeutic terms that describe some of the different characters that you might have. Like managers are typically the parts of yourself that are more maternal and like caregiving. And exiles are maybe like the shameful parts that get really anxious and worried about things. Um, and so I was kind of like working through some of those ideas. I had a... Um, 
a professor during undergrad kind of urged me to get into more gestural drawing. Um, I was really into the obsessive tight knit rendering. And so she was kind of like, let's just see what it's like for you <laughs> to make yourself uncomfortable and do something that's not that. And so I started making these giant gestural portraits of myself with myself on canvas and I was using my hair like it, it sounds gross but it made it for an interesting texture I was using like strands of my hair and like putting it in with the gesso and it created this like really interesting patina um, on all of these canvases and so I just started making a bunch of them um, and it was really fun I was liking how they were turning out and it was good practice and and taking this alternate route where I could get more gestural and not be so tied down to making it look precise. Um, but then I realized I could start taking these giant canvases I was I was drawing on and installing them together. And so this was something I did in the hallway of my school at the time. And so I was kind of just crumpling them up. And it's so interesting too, because you might have like realized this while installing them, but they, they get on your hands and stuff and I've sprayed fixative on them so many times and it there's just something so um I don't know like tangible about them just because they they're constantly shedding like hair and charcoal powder and like nothing gets it to all stick and so I was like practicing crumpling it up and hanging it in weird places and public places on campus and it was interesting how people interacted with them I had a um a dancer friend at the time she came and like danced on them and kind of smeared them and it felt very performative and unfortunately I don't have the documentation from that but it was really cool and I was just kind of practicing with like different ways I could install these together um I had done this can you see the video <laughs> I had done this like rotoscoping um drawing of myself and projected it on top of the canvases so I don't know and I've been playing with like shadows on the canvases so it was just getting kind of interesting. And I think this is kind of what I, I had installed it this way a bunch um, with all of them kind of together in this weird Beverly Sims sort of <laughs> style <laughs> draping thing on the wall. And I have like a close up detail here of what kind of the, the texture of these was like, but it was really getting me to break out of the, the tight knit rendering, kind of let go a little bit. Um, I started making these other pieces and they were each they were each a self-portrait of myself but they were definitely more loose and gestural and I hung them and installed them in a maze sort of structure so you would kind of have to walk through them and they were all kind of facing the direction that you would walk through and so this was kind of this was just me practicing and playing around with this ideally I think I, I would want to make more and make it a bigger, a bigger maze. But I was kind of just getting a little gestural and I was getting interested in installation. And anyways, that was what I was thinking about. But of course, I was like really missing uh, <laughs> drawing and getting um, tight knit. I wanted to, oh, I wanted to include these because at the time I was also um, I had a practice of making these small five by seven drawings. So I did one like almost every day for every year I was in college, basically. And it was kind of just, I guess, functioned in the way a sketchbook might, although I did keep a sketchbook. But for me, it was mostly writing. I, I write in words a lot. And so these were kind of just planning things out, figuring out what materials I liked and drawing these faces and like small versions and I don't know. I still I still kind of have this practice. It's definitely not as intense as it was during school, but I try to make a couple five by sevens every week just to get something done and practice with new materials in kind of a low stakes way. And of course, I, I inevitably went back to drawing on paper because I was just really missing it and it was feeling right at the time. And I started thinking about isolation and how I could how I could make that happen on paper. Um, and so I, I don't love this piece, but I drew myself in a cage. Um, I also started thinking a lot about like my body as a performance vehicle. 
Um, so I was thinking about positions and, you know, somatic psychology, like how do, how do our poses affect our moods and how does your body reflect what's going on inside? And so I was trying to think about how our bodies look when we feel alone or isolated or scared. And so I was kind of making drawings about that for a little bit. Um, and then I came back to the multiple. I usually do. <laughs> and so this is me with myself in a bathtub. To be honest, I don't really know what I was thinking here. I made this during a time. Well, what happened was after school, I, I ended up taking a nine to five um, corporate job. It was definitely not my path. I felt very wrong. Um, this was just something I was making in 10 minute increments, like after my job every day, a few of these were. And so I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing. I was kind of just making things, which I think you have to do. Um, I was also, <laughs> I made this piece at that time too. Um, it's, it's called identity crisis, but I was thinking more about the multiple selves and the parts and I was also just having a little identity crisis at the time of whether I wanted to stick with a more corporate career, or focus on my art. And I think as I was making this piece, it took me like a year to make it, which is, it's weird for me because during school and like prior to that, I had been finishing these pieces in a few days or a week. And it took me a year of making this and I never sat down for more than 10 minutes to work on it. So and this is life, like almost life size. These bodies are a little bit smaller than my body. Um, but yeah, I don't know. And I, I kept thinking about these different parts of the self and how they're in dialogue with each other. And, you know, I was having a hard time picking who I wanted to be for lack of a better term. I think I'll probably always struggle with that, but say la vie. Um, <laughs> I also, I was just getting more interested in, in the body and the multiple. And I, especially now I'm like really interested in performance and, and kind of how performance can translate into drawing. Um, and so, I don't know, I, I did these, a bunch of myself are kind of together in this weird watery situation. And the figure at the bottom is the one that's like grounded underneath everyone else. Um, this one, I entitled Collapse, and I started thinking about loneliness again and how to show that. Um, and I kind of have been sticking with this idea recently of, of claustrophobic solitude. Um, like these multiple selves are piled on top of each other and this like really suffocating loneliness. Um, and so kind of combining the idea of these multiple parts of the self and loneliness and how loneliness can feel really like claustrophobic and suffocating but that kind of seems like like an oxymoron a bit but that's just how it feels and so yeah this is more of the like claustrophobic solitude and oddly enough I feel like these two pieces where it's just me suffocating myself with myself that felt more lonely than like this one or the one in the cage I think the more of me there is the more suffocating <laughs> it feels <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, this is kind of what I was think have been thinking about. Um, and so I've kind of gotten to a place where this is kind of feels more on brand for what I'm thinking about now, um, like more recent. And so I've started framing my work in this light of, I guess, viewing my body as, um, syntax, um, so like using my posed figure as this vehicle for revealing different parts of the self and observing how we choose to present those parts. Um, and I'm really interested in self-presentation and how we're presenting ourselves and through our bodies. And I also think like staging my body in poses, it, it's been helping me reconnect and like ground myself in reality. <laughs> And I feel like as, as does the, the labor and time intensive practice of drawing with graphite pencils. And so I've kind of noticed within myself this um, need to get back to the things, get back to the physical, get back to the tangible. Um, I'm not sure if that was like brought on by the pandemic or I don't know, maybe just the digital world. Like maybe it's my child of the internet coming out, but 
<laughs> and there's something that feels really physical about my drawings lately and this kind of compulsion to render tightly and do things with my body and get as physical and analog as possible. And so also I should probably talk about like the process of how I make these, which is, um, so I'll take photos of myself with a tripod. And I think I'll usually just write down a few feelings that I'm having or things I'm thinking about and try to translate that into physical movement. And then I use those photos as references while drawing. And so it does like, I hadn't thought of myself as a performance artist in any way, but I've, I've been in this um, art group collective situation for the last several months. And I've kind of been talking about my work a lot more with those people. And they're kind of like, this feels very performative. Like this feels like, and so I don't know, it's kind of, I'm reframing myself in that way because I do perform for the camera like quite often, like almost every day I take photos of myself. And I think that practice alone is kind of interesting, but that's how I get these reference photos. And so this is something that I obviously made during the pandemic to have masks on. Um, but I think I've started describing my process here as technically indulgent um, and reflecting in these internal processes of the psyche. Um, but many of my drawings like this one begin with kind of this chaotic destruction. I got into the practice of kind of destroying the paper first and then reeling it in and doing the obsessive rendering. And so I crumple and tear and fold and ferociously like stomp on these giant sheets of paper and kind of let myself completely lose control. And then I start regaining control and doing the obsessive rendering and making it look as realistic as possible. And so this exercise of like purposefully losing control and then purposefully regaining it, it's like, it does feel like a very somatic and performative exercise. It's this physical deconstruction and reconstruction. And I feel like that reveals and kind of mimics the emotional process of um, like self-excavation, you know, tearing yourself apart and then putting yourself back together. Um, I also think there's something about this process that I've been doing that, or I guess, refuses um, like a digital digital veneer of perfection. I think <laughs> that was a lot, it was a mouthful, but yeah, that's kind of, that was, I don't know. It's something I've been thinking about. I wanna make things really perfect. Um, in like a compulsive way. And I'm constantly, just like I, my professor did for me in college, I'm constantly having to purposefully kind of orchestrate um, flexibility, like purposefully give myself the opportunity for failure um, and kind of make that part of the process. So yeah, I think just um, experimenting with the this idea of giving myself the opportunity to fail and then reeling it back in. And this is kind of like a play of control. Like it's just a control thing. It's like seeing how I can lose it and how I can get it back through the drawing. Um, anyways, I, I've also something I've been thinking about a lot recently is how is the information age. Um, it's kind of feels like it's been taking me away from my body and into my head a bit. I feel like a lot of people can relate to that, but um it does feel like the digital age is kind of severing me from the physical world and, and pushes and compels us to go inwards in an in interesting way, despite it kind of expanding our, our world. So in this work, I called it ear to the ground. Um, my body is like crouched and kind of animalistic and, but the head is really heavy and making the whole thing kind of be stagnant on the ground. So it's the body's ready to spring into action, but the head is weighing heavily on the earth. And this whole piece is about stagnation. Like I, I was thinking about stagnation as I took the reference photos. Um, and I think that's kind of something that I've been feeling in my life recently is it feels very slow and stagnant. And I feel like that relates to the digital madness that <laughs> I've been thinking about. Um, and so, yeah, this one definitely breaks away from the chaos control versus in the um, process. I absolutely did not beat up the paper. I think I just, I really wanted to get obsessive and render. And I don't know if there's like an element of, of like self-punishment in there. Like just <laughs> wanting to take, like take as long as possible to make something and make it as methodical as possible. But I mean, this work is pretty big. It's, I you know, five, 
six feet long or I have the inches down there, but math's hard. Um, <laughs> but basically I called it virtual relations. This is the first drawing I've done of, well, there's an, I'm in it, but it's the first person I've drawn other than myself in many years. This is my partner. Um, and we're seated on the couch. We each have a virtual headset on. So we're together, yet we're also apart. Um, I think there's something really interesting about that idea of the togetherness and apartness and kind of goes along with the ideas of loneliness and it just feels interesting and this is definitely something I want to explore more in the future. Um, but yeah, I think I've started viewing my body as a way to, or being viewing my drawing as a way to connect to my body and connect to the physical world in a time when life does feel increasingly digital. And I do have this draw, draw, uh -huh, to, <laughs> to do things um, obsessively and tight knit. And uh, I definitely, um, I go big, you know, these are, most of these are life size. Um, but yeah, I think this is kind of where I'm at in my art practice so far. I included a, um, a detail of this so you could kind of see the, the background took forever, but. But yeah, I think this is kind of where I'm at so far in my in my practice. And in terms of my career, which I feel like I feel like needs to be touched on um, to get like a full picture, or at least be helpful in like a classroom perspective. So I transitioned a year ago into doing I had been working at a corporation and I had transitioned to doing more contract work, um, things that were part time. So I was doing graphic design in a very part-time capacity. I was working 20 hours a week. And that's kind of what I've been doing for the last year. Um, and that's been able to sustain the art practice, which uh, I'm not, I don't count on for <laughs> income in any way. Um, but I'm kind of, I'm in the midst of applying to MFA programs right now. I have an interview tomorrow um, and we'll see how that goes. That feels like, the right path for me right now because I I think I've recently just decided recently I think I decided a year ago that I kind of needed to pursue the art it I was doing it in a very um I don't want to say hobby hobby-esque but it was getting put in the margins and I feel like it's taken a lot of careful organization of my life to make it the main focus mm -hmm. and put like money earning uh <laughs> jobs in the margins um and so it's been like a little dicey. I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. But I think I think I kind of just have had to make this concerted effort and decision that like this was the forefront of my life. This is what is going to be taking up my the most of my time and everything else will be pushed, will be pushed to the margins. So yeah, that's kind of my career that I've been balancing alongside the drawing practice. And like I said, I joined, I recently joined this like woman only drawing collective. They're based out of New York and we meet every week for a Zoom. Um, and it's been really great. And I think just trying to find those communities has been really helpful because making work in a vacuum is really difficult. I had, um, I guess, three years between my bachelor's and when I'll go for my master's this fall. And so, yeah, I think making work alone without a lot of feedback can be really difficult. You know, like during school critiques always seemed really brutal and like, I don't know, there's some hard parts about it, but ultimately it just makes you a better artist and the school setting is, I definitely didn't appreciate it as much as I should have when I was there. And so I guess just feel thankful now, like, <laughs> like really take as much as you can out of the experience. Um, because it's not, it's not the same when you, when you leave. Um, anyways, that's, yeah, I feel like I don't know where I'm at with time, but that's kind of what I have. And if you guys have any questions, I would love to answer them. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll open it up. Yeah, Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Can you? So his question is, um, what suggestions do you have or, or like recommendations of how do you make that that where um, art is the more important part of your life? 
Yeah, I guess I think mainly mainly deciding was kind of the hard part for me. I I had been really straddling these two kind of different paths for a long time. Even when I went to school, I I got a mar whole marketing degree alongside my fine art degree um, because I just couldn't. I I just I don't know. It was hard to art feels very risky and if you're a risk averse person like I am it can be really hard to just make the choice to do it full time knowing that there's like not a lot of stability in it and not a lot of money in it um especially when you're starting out not to say that people aren't like successful obviously they are but I think in the first few years of of an art career um it's really it can be really confusing and I think, yeah, I, I guess in terms of suggestions, you know, I think just getting creative about the jobs you're selecting. Um, at the time, I had a lot of friends. I still have a lot of friends that are like engineers and corporate -y people. They went into kind of corporate jobs. And so it just kind of seemed like the thing to do. And those paths are quite linear. They can be, um, you know, you apply, you interview, you work there, you get promoted. It's everything's kind of laid out for you in this sort of structure. And kind of the thing about being an artist is there's not really a governing body that will be like, hey, you're an artist now, like, congrats, you've done it. It's like something that you have to assert for yourself. Like even going to school isn't going to give you the title. It's something you, it requires a lot of assertiveness, assertion. But if that's something that comes hard to you, like it comes hard to me, then it, it does just take a conscious effort to just decide that you're going to do it, decide that you're not going to go on a linear path like maybe the people around you are and kind of get creative about what other jobs are available outside of outside of nine to fives. And so I was taking a lot of graphic design contracts Um kind of just cold emailing people, asking around if anyone needed help with that sort of thing. Graphic design kind of translates well, it like vibes well with the art. You're already kind of learning composition and color and stuff. So um, that can be something. Um, I, I, this is, I don't know if this is embarrassing, but I, I recently got a job at um, painting with a twist. It's like, you know, like, Hair and sort of ladies come in and they learn how to paint I don't know just just little stupid things while they drink wine and it's it's cute it's fun but it's like you learn those skills in school anyways and so you could get a job doing that and it's, it's at nighttime so now I can draw during the day and so it's pick it's purposefully picking jobs that will allow you to make as much as possible um and that can be really scary if the people around you aren't doing that yeah, sorry, I went on a tangent. I think no, but that, I think that's that's really beneficial. Um, uh, it's an authentic experience, and I think that idea of having um, a diverse skill set to rely upon to um, support that transition to making art as part of your everyday practice. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever capacity and ebb and flow that that will have over the course of your um, artistic path but mm -hmm. by um you know even even this like painting with a twist or you know, even a job like that you're still surrounding yourself you're 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 more in an art related type of job than if you were you know working stocking shelves at a grocery store you know, there's, it's a little bit more relevant to your, to your field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's so many different ways to do it too. Like, I think for me, it helps to pick things that are kind of related to the drawing or kind of feel like they feed into it that are not intrusive with time. They don't take up a lot of time. I definitely have artist friends who do work nine to fives and they're able to get a lot done on the weekends. And that totally is good for them. It didn't work for me, but it definitely, I don't want to discourage anyone from getting one. Um, you know, it can be really stable, <laughs> like having the same paycheck come in every every week or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think it's kind of just figuring out like what your practice requires and then tending to that. Yeah. Other questions at all? Every day, every day of the week, 
you can actually do without working for you as well. I don't know, for me that's the next down the part. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you could you could hear the question, but it was more like, oh, go ahead. No, just bits and parts. Could you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she was asking about like how to, working, say even with graphic design or I think any other yeah. job, like how to take daily conscious choices or actions and to ensure that you're actually working in the studio, you're actually like <laughs> gradually working on whatever tasks you're trying to to accomplish in the studio like finding that balance like yes, self-motivation to like do it <laughs> yeah. yeah no it's really hard when you don't have deadlines and no, like it's 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 like I said it's hard in a vacuum you don't have like deadlines and when you're not in school like nobody's asking you to make anything like I could not draw and nobody would say anything to me and when I'm done the drawings get rolled up and they might go to a show but they might not they might stand under my bed for a long time so the motivation part is really hard like I'm I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm like an expert at like getting myself to draw every day but I think I think building it into a routine has worked for me being like kind of making myself do it I it's kind of like the gym like you know, like you don't feel like you want to go, but getting there is the hardest part. Like kind of once you're there, it feels good and you're enjoying your workout. I kind of feel the same way about drawing. Like sometimes I really just don't want to do it. Like I know it's good for me, but if I just set like a 10 or 20 minute timer and I'm like, I'm just going to draw for 10 minutes. That's it. I can stop if I want after 10. I usually don't. I'll go for hours, but it's just yeah. the first it's the first 10 minutes and getting yourself to do that. So I think just starting with something that feels really easy, like low barrier to entry, whatever it may be, like, I'm just going to do a quick sketch for however long that feels like it's not hard. And then just, if you feel like continuing, continue, and you probably will, you know, you probably will want to, it's just getting yourself there, I think can be the hard part. And like, I don't know, that's kind of what's been working for me. <laughs> Well, and you may find too, as you transition to a, a, a graduate program, that that motivational drive will shift, like you're going to go into hyperdrive <laughs> when yes. you're in that type of environment again. I but, get really motivated by other people, like egging me on. And so I don't know if you're the type, that type of person, then school is really great. And so that's definitely what I, what I'm excited for. I know how I'll be when I'm around other artists and, but yeah, alone, being alone and drawing or painting or whatever your practice is, it, it hits different for me and it requires me to be a lot more intentional about, about making time for it. Okay, other questions? So like when you're planning out your ideas, like how do you go about planning it out? And then the like second part of that is with the rendering, you know, sharing, and I, I'm going to piggyback on that, like using liquid graphite, you want to share <laughs> multiple questions with that one, but. <laughs> yeah, like the, the process of drawing and planning it out, that's, that's what, okay. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I've, I've just been using, I think I went really deep with my uh, practice in the sense that I, I, I didn't try a lot of other materials. I found one that I liked and I only used that for a really, really long time. And it kind of like forced me to figure out how to do it quickly and efficiently. Um, but in terms of planning things out, you know, I'll take the photographs, um, as much as I hate doing this because this feels a lot like what I, my work, I'll put everything into Photoshop. Um, and especially if there's multiple of me in it, you know, I want to mock it up and see what the two figures are going to look like together, three figure five with 10, whatever, and kind of see how they're interacting. So I'll get like kind of a little mock up of the photos in Photoshop. And then I, for a long time, I was measuring out like the proportions um, of the people. 
And it was taking a really long time. And my friend was like, why don't you buy a projector? Like, I think you've proven <laughs> to yourself that you know how to, how to measure. Why, why would, why are you still doing this? <laughs> and so I was like, touche. And so I now use a projector. Um, and so I'll put the Photoshop mock-up on, on the projector and project it onto the piece of paper, outline it. And then in terms of rendering, I use like, I just, I use graphite pencils mostly, but I started using powder too, um, to cover like really big areas and just get that like base foundation on, you know, like nothing's white, nothing's ever white. So getting something on first and especially with the pieces that I've been doing recently where I like beat up the paper first, like that's really fun. Um, and it kind of gets rid of the first step of like getting just tone on the paper, um, and it also kind of adds in a subtractive step. And so getting to like use the eraser a bit and like subtract where the areas are too dark can be kind of fun too. Um, but yeah, I think I plan out the materials usually in a sketchbook or in my five by sevens first, especially if I'm beating up the paper. And for like some of these I was using, um, like this is liquid graphite, which was really interesting and they tint it too. So it was like a yellow that came out green, but it was like a yellow tinted graphite. And so I had done a bunch of experiments with these on the five by sevens and just kind of seeing how dark I could get it, how light it happened. And then when I went into like actually building up the patina, the paper, I kind of like had an intuitive feel for what it was like. Um, so it wasn't like figuring it out for the first time on, on this giant piece of paper. Um, so I, I don't know, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Other I think it's something that I that I feel like I observed, you know, being part of the committee of faculty that was like looking at your drawings when it, your submission was, you know, when you submitted to show. Um, we do always try to align our exhibitions with our the courses that we teach. Um, and it, it's, it was so refreshing when seeing your work and that we could have had it really at any time um, as far as like our curriculum goes because we are a very um, drawing centered, observation based <laughs> program in um, at least awesome. primarily in our, in our drawing classes. And it was refreshing to see um, figurative work I feel like for a long period of time, um, the the idea of the figure is something like, oh, it's been done before. Yeah. Um, why do we need to return um, to um, using the figure as our subject matter? But I feel like there's something different in the way that these have been done, whether it's through composition or you know just the subtle inclusion of some type of clothing or fabric feels contemporary to now. Um, Thank you. And I, I just, it's just interesting to see, you know, it'll be interesting to see where your work goes after starting a graduate program and the, the shift and evolution that will happen <laughs> over the course of, of that. But I feel like having them all together in one space, not obviously not all the drawings that you've been doing, but a selection of them. Mm -hmm. um, there's a different conversation that happens when they're all together. Have you, um, you know, in thinking about where you're at in your academic path, how many times have you really experienced your work being up, you know, like eight to 10 pieces all in one, one place? And has that changed the way you think about your work? Yeah, very rarely. Like, I'm trying to think if if I've ever seen it all to like a bunch of pieces together like that. Usually <clears throat> if my work's been in a show in the last few years, it's like a one-off, like it's included right. in like a group situation or something like that. And um, I like, I actually didn't even get to see all my work together after getting my BFA. Um, I had a whole like solo show planned where I was going to get to like see everything in the evolution of it. I was like really excited about it. Um, it got canceled at the last minute because it was in 2020. It was um, like right before everything got shut down. 
And so that never happened. So I kind of had it all like mocked up. I had like the idea there. I like saw it in my mind's eye and it just, it never happened. So I don't, I think this is actually the first time that I've ever seen a bunch of my things together in the same room rather than just one-offs in group shows, which is really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, thank you. It is it is kind of interesting. There's like an aversion to figure I've noticed. It's not something I realized when I was in school, but definitely when I got out, um, yeah. I was like, wow, okay, I people don't think this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> How do they not think this is cool? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, we do have some questions for it. So we yeah, do have yeah. some questions for that. Yeah. So logistics on paper. So we have a question about like what type of, uh, I'm assuming it's rag paper, but what type of paper and then where are you buying it? Cause it's so large. And it's oh my gosh. Yeah. Struggle of my life, honestly. The source. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, during school, I didn't have to worry about it because they supplied me with paper. They had a, a budget for it, which was just really nice. Um, out of school, I've kind of I learned that paper was really expensive these last <laughs> years. It was such a culture <laughs> shock three years ago. I was like, wait, what? And so, anyways, um, I guess there's sometimes some deals on like Blick. Um, I don't know, just any of those art websites. I try to find like. I try to find coupon codes and discounts and stuff for ordering like those giant rolls. They have like the big rolls with them. But then I've also gotten like a little bit creative and there's a bunch of um, like art reuse stores around here. I'm sure they're where you guys are too, but people will donate their crafts and art supplies and things. And so no, I- we don't have those here. <laughs> Nothing like that? <laughs> no, I at honestly... least not in the Central Valley of California, probably in the Bay Area. But... Maybe in the Bay Area if you're yeah. if you get to make a drive up there. Um, but they had one in Seattle where I lived a year ago. They have one here in Austin. Um, yeah, they can be, they can be hard to find, but I've realized that they're, I've been looking it up and they, there's like a few donation centers, it's like Goodwill, but for supplies and yeah, oh, people will donate giant rolls of things. Are they always easy to draw on? Like, no, you know, it's not ideal, but I have drawn on like wallpaper. People will donate, um, this blue paper was total. I bought this whole roll. It was, and this was cropped. I think the roll, it didn't even fit in my car. It was 12 feet long. It hung out the back of it and I got it for $4. <laughs> and I felt really good about that. I, um, I just bought a roll at the reuse center for, you know, and I don't know how much this costs at retail, but I assume it's less than drawing paper. It's like photo paper that they use for backdrops, you know, how they put the white paper when they're photographing things. And so I've been doing some experiments on that. It seems to be working okay. I don't, I haven't done a big drawing on it yet. I think it'll work out TBD on that, but it was very cheap. Um, and I think it's probably cheaper than buying drawing paper so maybe that's something to check out too but yeah wallpaper can be fun <laughs> I don't there's know a, there's um uh tackage print and paper they're a printmaking supply company based out of Albuquerque New Mexico they okay. usually supply Blick with their paper their, oh. roll, their giant rolls of paper too it's expensive but they yeah have the best selection of paper Oh, good to know. What's it called? It's a big paper, per paper person. Ruben, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. So this question is more actually geared towards graphic design. Okay. Um, and that like, how did you seek out um, you know, contract work, or how did you seek out different jobs and what were they, what type of things were they looking for? Yeah. Okay. So, so I had taken a few like graphic design classes during school for like, what do you call those extra, like extracurriculars, like the ones you could tag on. Um, or I don't know if that's what it's called. Anyways, electives, I, yeah. electives, electives. Yeah. So I had taken a bunch of graphic design electives. So I had like 
a very modest graphic design portfolio. It was not great, but there I had something and I used that to get my first job, which was a nine to five. And it, again, <laughs> I didn't like it, but because it was just a lot of time, but it, that helped me build up an even bigger portfolio. Um, so I had stuff from that job. I had stuff from school. Um, I had a graphic design internship during college over a summer at one point where I had a couple, a few things from that. And so I kind of had just been building up a portfolio. I, like I'm not a designer. I, I have friends that like graphic design was their major that like they went and they're in New York and they're at the ad agencies. Like that's their thing. That's not me, <laughs> but there's so, you know, there's a lot of small companies that don't want an expensive graphic designer like that. They just want somebody that knows the basics and has a modest portfolio and knows how to lay things out and like understands basic Photoshop. And like, you know, that's pretty easy to learn on your own and make things. And, you know, if you can get an internship and make a few things there, that always looks good. And, but yeah, in terms of finding like those smaller companies, um, I really have just been like kind of using connections on LinkedIn and stuff. I, uh, a friend of a friend kind of knew of this small like skincare company that wanted some graphic design stuff done in a casual way. So I started working for them in a contract capacity. And then it just kind of started building word of mouth. I would like reach out to people on LinkedIn. Sometimes I cold email people. Um, you know, I had a friend from college that was like, we need a graphic designer. I hear you're doing that now. And so I took that, like, there's just random jobs will kind of if you start putting it out there and like putting feelers out there and developing a little portfolio, I feel like things have kind of just been coming to me um, just based on, on putting myself out there on LinkedIn being like, I'm doing this now. Like I'm not expensive, like, because I, I'm not a professional. Like, <laughs> I mean, don't say that, but like, you know, there is a market for, for it. <laughs> like, Any other questions? All right. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, we, we actually have one more. Sorry. Yep. So there's a, a question um, related to like, what was the transition point of like, why you wanted to include the like actual hair into, into the piece? Oh, like going from drawing it to including it into the piece. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it was really a, a conscious thought that I even had. I just, I was thinking a lot about hair and how much it sucks. And I was working on these giant pieces and kind of, you know, I was, I had my Jackson Pollock moment, like the canvases were on the floor and I was just like kind of going at them and my hair started falling out. And I was like, this hair is so annoying. Like, the, you know, and then I was like, wait, like maybe, maybe, it, maybe That's it's part of it. <laughs> part of it. Um, and so then I just kind of started collecting my hair and like, you know, sweeping my studio floor and like, this sounds weird, like going into my hairbrushes and like pulling it out and like saving it to be in the drawing. <laughs> um, but it was more, that was more of like an accidental, like, oh, like maybe this would be, maybe this goes with it. Um, you know, it's not like I pulled out my hair and was like, I'm definitely like, it wasn't like I had planned to do it. It kind of just evolved into that because of the things I had been thinking about um, already. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your time so much and for you sharing about your practice. And um, it's wonderful to have your work in our space and we'll enjoy it for the next, <laughs> until the end of the month. And um, this is recorded, so I'll make it available um, to be viewed on YouTube and I'll share it with you once it's, once it's up. Cool, well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you, you know, inviting me to speak. This was really fun. <laughs> All right. Best to you. We'll be in touch. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.